means God is expressing how he feels. And so we make this about money, but money follows the deeper meaning of this. Because the truth of the matter is, we don't care about how God feels enough. He's telling you he feels robbed. And if you care about how God feels, then you understand what your action should be after he tells you how he feels. Yet you have robbed me. But ye say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offering, ye are cursed with a curse. But ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. <laughs> Somebody say storehouse. <laughs> that there may be meat in my house. Now, some of you are already ahead because you watched my Deep Waters episode. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. I want to go back to verse number 10 when he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. There's a couple of things that I believe we as people have to do a better job at. We have to do a better job of interrogating every text. You have to ask questions about what you're reading and not to people, you have to ask those questions to God. Why would you tell me to bring the tithe to the storehouse if really where I'm bringing them is to the church? It must mean that there's a tithe that's deeper than money. Because if I understood that tithe, it wouldn't be a problem for me to give the money as a tithe. When I find out what the storehouse is, I will understand why I'm supposed to tithe. That there may be meat. Second question, what is meat? And how does my money make their meat? When we make stuff up, we just, when we don't know, we just make stuff up in our mind. But he says, I want there to be meat in my house. And in this month of witness, he says, prove me. The word witness means evidence. He says, test me. Listen, put me on the witness stand. Examine me and cross-examine me and see if I will not open you the window of heaven and pour out a blessing. When you examine me, see if my word is not true. And so many of you have an open case with God because you're still wondering if God can keep his word. I want to talk for just a few minutes from this thought, case closed. Just for a few minutes, the case is closed. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Tell somebody the case is closed. In this month of witness, in our Western culture, just stay with me and, and take a ride with me for a minute, will you? Y'all praying for me? The reason we have witnesses in our court system in our Western culture, we have witnesses in any case. It's for the purposes of evidence. We are looking 
for evidence that will prove whatever it is that bears the burden of proof. And so if you're trying to prove something, there has to be evidence. And in our court system, it needs to be beyond a reasonable doubt. The word reasonable leaves room for interpretation because there can be doubt, but the court says it's gotta be beyond reasonable doubt. And so they are looking for people to be witnesses because the hope is that they can present some evidence on behalf of either the defense or the prosecution that will allow for us to understand all of the facts. Somebody say facts. Evidence lends to fact. And if I know the facts according to our way of doing things in our Western culture and in the court system and the way we have shaped our minds, if I know facts, then I understand what happens and the facts give me the evidence so that we can understand the full picture of what happened. When you're dealing with facts, things can be factual and they can be scientifically true. In fact, in this day and time, we have moved into DNA evidence. One of the greatest witnesses in our time is DNA. That DNA will speak when there is no person to speak. DNA is science. It is factual. It is, in fact, more powerful than the testimony of a person. Because a person can alter the facts. A person, based upon their connection to the case, can lie about the facts. Or maybe they thought they saw what they saw and they didn't really see it at all. But DNA, which is science, is a loud truth-telling fact. And that fact produces evidence that is the greatest witness in proving innocence or guilt. But understand something about facts and science, that God is not against science, he created science. He works with science so that we might see who he really is. Y'all please stay with me. In fact, Romans chapter number one, Alex, he says he has given us creation that we might know him. Creation is science. I gave you the water so that you can understand according to Ephesians that we are washed by the water, which is the word of God. And as spiritual as you want to make that, it is really just one part hydrogen, two parts oxygen that represent how my word will wash you, that represent how my spirit will move in your life. I created that science, and it is a fact that water is wet. The issue is not that God is against facts or that he is against evidence because in our culture, the evidence produces facts. And God is not against facts. Somebody say, God is not against facts. The issue with God is not that he is against facts or evidence or science. The issue with God is that he is bigger than the science. He is bigger than the facts. And he is bigger than the evidence. Which means regardless of what the facts say, 
God has the final say. I'm trying to help you. Because sometimes we get choked up on the facts of life. And we can't wrap our mind around the reality of God because of what the science says. The science says I'm sick. The science and the fact is I do not have the money that by now I think I should have. The science says I do struggle with depression. The fact is that I really should be emotionally imbalanced based upon the trauma in my life. Nobody can take that from you. And the problem is, in church, we have tried to shout through the facts. But you cannot shout me through the facts without helping me understand that the reason I'm shouting is because I serve a God that created the facts but is bigger than the facts. That no matter what the science says, he says, I am omniscient, which means I am omniscience, which means I am bigger than science. And the word science, hear me, simply means knowing. It means to know something. And the problem with many of us is we know too much. And because we know so much, God can't get in our lives and do what he wants to do. So if our Western culture uses witnesses in order that they might bring evidence and facts and science, the Bible teaches us that God uses witnesses slightly different for a bigger issue. Our Bible teaches us that even though I deal in science and I deal in evidence and I deal in facts, God says, I use witnesses for something bigger. I use witnesses not only for evidence, but I use witness for establishment. Just stay with me. I'm, I'm, I'm. He says, when I use witnesses, I use witnesses in order to establish something. So evidence is the reality or the fact of a thing, but establishment means to firmly fix something. It means to permanently fix a thing. And so he says in his word the same thing the court system says, but when he says it, he says, I mean it so that I may establish something. The court says, in order that I might believe this story, I need more than just you to tell me this story. So you say you weren't there and you didn't do it. So I either need DNA to testify on your behalf, or I need another person, an eyewitness to testify on your behalf. God says, I'm not using more than one person for evidence. I'm using more than one person for establishment. So he says, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every word, come on, be established. Meaning, I know what the facts say. But I'm telling you to ignore the facts and pay attention to what I have established in your life. I'm trying to help somebody. That no matter what the doctor's report says, that no matter what the credit report says, that no matter what the loan officer said, I believe that there's something bigger that God has said. And since you don't believe me, I'm going to give you two or three witnesses that will establish, Lord have mercy, what I have said in your life. Can you look at somebody and don't touch them because there's power that happens in your touch today. Don't touch them. I ain't ready for that kind of power surge yet. Just look at them and tell them, neighbor, I got three words for you 
that will help establish the next season of your life. Tell them, neighbor, here are your three words. It's already done. For those of you that were at church last Sunday. No, 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 no organ, no organ. No, uh, y'all, you're going to send the room all the way over. Just tell somebody it's already done. It's already done. Because regardless of what the evidence says, I serve a God who is in the facts, but says, I will give you something that I have established. And when I have established this, be seated, when I have established this, I establish it before the foundation of the world. And so there are some things that I have firmly fixed in your life. There are some things that I have firmly established in your life. I wish I had time to go deeper. I wish I could go deeper even about the anatomy of your father and why he is the one who determines the sex of the baby. Because it is really just a testimony. It is a witness out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let everything in your life be established. I pre-establish what I'm going to do in your life. And when you are born and you go through your life, sometimes the facts don't look like what I have established. And I purposely take you through things that don't look like what I promise. Because the facts aren't for you to believe in. The truth is what you believe in. And truth is different from fact. The facts say that I am broke. But the truth is that he wish that I prosper and be in good health even as my soul prosper. So sometimes I have to ignore fact and deal with and believe in and keep holding on to truth. Because here's the purpose of fact. The purpose of fact is to get me ready for the truth. I'll say it again because I don't want you to miss it. The reason you're going through the scientific, realistic hell that you're going through in your life and you're sick and you're depressed and you're going through trouble and you're crying and you're broke is because God is just conditioning you so that you are not weak when he finally takes you into what he has established for you. Can I just keep cooking in this crock pot? I don't really like microwave food. I, I'm just trying to help you understand that what you are dealing with is just the facts of what he has already established for you. Look at somebody and say, I've got to know the truth. I've got to know the truth. I cannot live my life just based upon the facts without knowing the truth. So God from the, God of the, from the beginning has been a God of evidence and establishment. He sometimes uses the evidence to bring us to faith because the truth will always trump the facts. If it's established, then the evidence doesn't matter because regardless of what the evidence says, it's just preparing me for what God has for me. Somebody say, he's just getting me ready. He's just getting me ready. We, as God's people, can I keep slow walking? Sometimes let facts or evidence keep us from the truth or what he has established for us. And the issue that we have, mother, sometimes is that we have trouble remembering who God is and what he has already done for us. Because the truth of the matter is, most of you in this room have already been a recipient of the establishment of God. We just have some uh, spiritual amnesia. You, you have already been a recipient of the establishment of God. 
because to, the reality is for the 75 of you in this room who don't mind giving God praise for what he has already done is that the facts say that you should have been dead a long time ago. You should have been in the mental ward of a hospital in a straitjacket, not even knowing your name. But because of what God has established in your life, the devil couldn't kill you. And not only could he not kill you, but he couldn't have your mind. And not only could he not have your mind, but he couldn't have your children. I'm just trying to help somebody because you act like life is over every time you're going through some factual stuff. But you ain't looking at what God has already established. That the reason you are still here and your family is still here is because God made you a promise. I'm trying to hold it together because he made you a promise and because of what my God he because of what he has promised because of what he has promised because of what he has promised so oh, and blessed is she that believes for there shall be a performance because of what he has promised is why I'm still alive Dupree the only way I can explain it is because God made me a promise. He has established some things in my life. And I've got to remember. Somebody say remember. I've got to remember what he has done. Adam and Eve, they did what we call in the Greek, dakamazo God. They examined him. They put him in question in their mind. He created them, yet they questioned him in a way that was not seeking answers. It was questioning his creative authority. They were not seeking answers from God when they allowed the devil to whisper in their, in their ear. They moved into a space of examination with God that caused them to question, God, are you really the God that you said you were? They allowed the devil to drop seeds in their mind that examined him when he had been the one that not only created them, but given them everything that they had. How dangerous is it for God to have created you? God to have sustained you? God to have preserved you? And you let the slew foot devil, Lucifer, drop nuggets in your mind to make you forget who God really is. Are y'all with me in here? This is why God tells the Apostle Paul to tell the church at Philippians that it is not irksome or irritating for me to say the same thing over and over again to you. In fact, he says it is safe for you because you have to repeat a thing to remind people of a thing. This is why, Brandon, the book of Deuteronomy is in our Bible in the Pentateuch because it is a restatement of the law. It is God, watch this, reminding the people of what he has done for them before they go to the promised land. And we have to be reminded many times of what God has done for us sometimes so we won't mess up what it is that God is doing in our life. Right before we get to the promised land will always be the biggest battle of our lives. Right before, here, come close. I want to whisper this. Your neighbor shouldn't hear this. Right before you get to what God has established, you're going to be in the fight of your life. Right before you get ready to walk into and cross over into the promise and the established thing of God and get ready to see what he established and witness what he has established, you're going to be in a fight for your life. Which is the reason why God says before you go in there, 
before you cross over, let me remind you of what I have done for you. Let me remind you of how good I have been to you. Let me remind you of how I have kept you and your family and your generation. And the devil's trying to get you to focus on who you lost and what you lost. But the truth of the matter is, I have much more left over than what I lost. Who am I talking to? And he knows, the devil knows, that once you cross over and become a witness and start telling people about what the Lord has done for you, that now you become a problem for hell. Because like I said last week, once you become a witness and have survived your season of slaughter, your praise has power. And the last thing the devil needs is somebody who has survived a season of hell to open your mouth and shout about it. Can you look at somebody, don't touch them yet because I, I need to finish my message. Can you look at somebody and tell them, uh, don't you make sure you remember, come on tell them, make sure you remember what the Lord has done for you while you're in your tough season. Come on, don't get amnesia while you're going through. It means while I'm broke, I remember how he paid my bills. It means while I'm sick, I remember that he healed my mama and he healed my auntie and he healed my body. Come on, and if, thank you Ty Tribbett, if he did it before. Come on, same God right now. Look at somebody and tell them he's getting ready to do it again. Come on, tell them he's getting ready to give me a repeat performance. Y'all not saying it. I said, tell somebody he's getting ready to give me a repeat performance. He's about to remind me of who he is. Adam and Eve, they examined him. They put God on the witness stand. I need you to know that there's about to be something great birthed in this room this morning. I need you to know there's about to be something great birthed in this room this morning. Because I wrestled with this message all week long. I could never get this message settled in my spirit. In fact, this message didn't get settled in my spirit until I was getting phone call after phone call this morning telling me what was going wrong. I said, Lord, yep, this is the one. This, <laughs> this is the one that's going to deliver your people. Can you open your mouth and speak over yourself and say, I got to remember what the Lord has done. Take your seats. Just give me a few more minutes. I got to make sure that as I am looking at God and I am looking at the evidence that I don't forget that even though I'm looking for evidence, I have to make sure I remember that I should be looking for establishment. It is here now where I am grieved and have issues with the handling of the book of Malachi. I'm grieved at how we have taught and preached this and have skipped over the tone of the book and gone straight to the money in the book. Because the money in the book doesn't mean a thing if you don't help me understand the tone of the book. You have to understand what the prophet Malachi is dealing with. You have to understand what the prophet Malachi is going through as a prophet of God that is burdened by God. You have to know that as a prophet, he is feeling what God is feeling. Much like the prophet Hosea, the one who had to marry a harlot so that he could feel how God feels when we go whoring after other things. Malachi is feeling the burden of God because God, much like you and I, has been doing things for Israel for many generations now, and Israel continues to forget God. 
Adam and Eve released a spirit in the earth that even though God created and loved his people, his people kept incorrectly examining him and putting him on a witness stand that was not one that was trying to get information, but it was one that was questioning, are you the God that you say you are? Now, what blows my mind is God is always in question when things are not going your way. Mm, but the question changes when he's your genie in the bottle and your Santa Claus and giving you what you want. Are y'all going to talk to me in here? It, it, it amazes me how all of a sudden we want to question. This is my problem with John the Baptist. When John the Baptist knew that he was sent to prepare the way for the Lord, he knew his cousin, they had had an encounter when they were in their mother's womb. John, you felt the power from your mother's womb. You leaped when you got in the presence of the king. You couldn't even contain yourself when you got in the presence of Jesus as a as a infant or as a embryo, I should say, in your mother's womb. Uh, Jesus was just a zygote because John's mother was six months further than Mary was. John was already a a embryo for six months you go into the presence of a zygote a baby that is barely formed yet and you feel so much power that the Bible says you leap in the womb of your mother you come out of the womb and you feel the presence and you feel the weight of the prophet Elijah because of your assignment and you begin in the wilderness preaching to God knows Leon what because in the wilderness nobody's there but y'all ain't ready for that conversation and you are preparing the way of the Lord which is another message by itself you are eating locusts and wild honey because of your call and then you are blessed when it's your time to baptize our Lord and Savior You've already encountered him in the womb. When you baptize him, you hear the Trinity from heaven. You are baptizing the Son. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And God the Father speaks and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You have experienced all of this. And now, John, you get in trouble. And you are in a prison. And because you want God to take you out of your hard situation, now you have the nerve, the audacity, the mitigated goal to question, are you the savior or should we look for another one? Are you kidding me? All of the evidence and the establishment that you have seen. And now because you are stuck between a rock and a hard place, you are questioning the Savior. Many of you are shaking your head at John, but you're just like him. You have seen him work in your life. And yet when you get stuck between a rock and a hard place, you no longer remember what God has already done for you. And Malachi is speaking to a people who have forgotten what God has done for them. He is giving a message to a people who have been 100 years removed from Babylonian exile. They have been released from Babylonian bondage. Jerusalem is still deserted. After they have come out of bondage, things are not going the way that they thought that they would go. And they are still dealing with some stuff. And even though they have seen God work, things are not going the way they want them to go. The land is still barren and uncultivated. The temple is finished, re being rebuilt, but it looks nothing like Solomon's temple. And there is a corrupt new generation of Israelites 
that have been birthed since the time of fruitfulness in the land. I don't have time, but the reason why you got to be careful how you treat and remember God is because it's going to pass down from generation to generation. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, which is the book of remembering and restating, he kept telling them, Moses kept telling them, make sure you rehearse this in the ears of your children. Make sure your children know how good God has been to us. And the problem is when you forget, your children won't remember. Nehemiah has rebuilt the wall and all Israel is asking is was it worth it what we went through? 70 years of captivity, was it worth it? The problem that Israel has is even though they have not stopped worshiping God, they can't remember what God has done for them because they had ritual without relationship. So they're in church. But if you study the state of Israel, they are doing the minimum of what is being asked of them. They're in church, but they're watching their watches because they're ready to get to the restaurant or they're ready to get to the football game. <laughs> Y'all don't want to have church with me. They, they, they are attending when they have to. They are reading their Bibles when they feel depressed. They are only opening the word of God when they feel like they're in trouble. They're only using God as a drug and not as somebody that they can lean and depend on. The great philosopher Karl, Karl Marx, Marx says that religion is the people's opium. He says that we will take our shot of Jesus in our arm and then go ahead and won't talk to him until it's time for us to come back to church and get high again. You got to be careful that you're not taking religion like a drug because in order for you to get to the establishment of God, you're going to have to have a relationship with God. Who am I talking to in here? It's a dangerous, dangerous place to be in God when you move from relational to transactional. I do not want a transactional relationship with God. I don't want God handing me money and then I'll talk to him when I need more money later on. I do not want God blessing my body and then I don't come back until I'm sick again. I do not want to come to church just when it's time for the doors to open and not ask God, how can I serve you in ministry? And the problem with them is that even though they have seen God do so much, listen to me, they have traumatic residue. It is when your trauma still has residue even though you're out of it. So even though they are 100 years moved from captivity, they are still acting like slaves. And when you study Malachi, you understand the exile or them being freed from Babylon changed nothing inside of them. So me freeing you from several bondages doesn't change you. What a dangerous place to be in. But the message of Malachi is Regardless of all of this, I still love you. The first dispute that Malachi has with the people, and understand because he's a prophet, he's really talking on behalf of God. So it sounds like a man talking to people, but because he's a prophet, it is God talking to people. The people, the first dispute they had is they questioned the love of God. You have the nerve to question my love for you. When you are the one that have been giving yourself to other gods, and I've been standing here waiting on you the whole time. His response was, 
I chose you. Watch this. Over your brother Esau. Remember when I had a choice between you and your brother Esau, Jacob. He says, I chose you. One way that you should never forget that God loves you is to remember that he didn't have to choose you. Can you tell somebody next to you, he chose me. The second dispute they have, watch this, is because God is reminding them, you are giving me lame offerings. You are giving me your leftovers when I gave you the whole thing. Watch it. The, 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 the contentiousness in Malachi is not that the people were not giving to God. It was that they were giving God crippled stuff. Like when you go into a store and there is usually a clearance rack, it's not just because the stuff is out of season. It's because most of the time the stuff that they're selling you on clearance is irregular. It is the misfits of the clothes. And they had the nerve after God has pulled them through all they have gone through to give God the lambs that nobody else wanted. Here's what's mind-blowing. That you're not going to go and purchase anything with misfit money. I don't care how much of a discount you want in Louis Vuitton. If you want it, you're going to pay what's on the price tag. I don't care how much of a discount you want on a BMW. If you want it, you're going to. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me in here. It's amazing, though, we are always wanting to get God, for God to give us a discount. That God, you can have whatever I have left and whatever I don't want, you can have that. And God's problem with them is that why are you giving me what nobody else wants when nobody else could have given you what I gave you? Y'all ain't, ain't here. Let me say it again. Why are you giving me what nobody else wants when nobody else that you're giving to could have given you what I gave you? The first problem we have is that we have forgotten his faithfulness. Tell somebody you can't ever forget his faithfulness. He asked them, will a man rob God? And watch it, they say, how have we robbed you? He says, you robbed me in your tithe and your offering because you were giving me whatever you wanted to help me preach it, whatever you wanted to give me. They gave God their lame leftovers. And God is saying, did you forget everything that I brought you from? Israel had gone through bondage and they, they were disconnected and delusional. Acting as if God hadn't given them the best of the best and taken them out so many times. It is of the Lord's mercy that you are not consumed. God said, I got to remind you that when you started as a family, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I made you a nation. You forgot that when you became a nation, I multiplied you in Exodus in the midst of your problems. Did you forget that I preserved you while you were in the pain of your Egyptian bondage? Did you forget that when I got ready to bring you out of Egypt, I parted the waters and made a way where there was no way to bring you out? Did you forget that I kept you in not one, not two, but three different bondages? And you still are around to be a people. Do you not remember and not hear how I kept Daniel while he was in a den of lions? I need y'all to stay with me because folk getting ready to get real sleepy right now. Do you not remember when they put the three 
three Hebrew boys in the fire in the captivity you were just in that I kept them and got in the fire with them? Look at somebody and say, you cannot forget the faithfulness of God towards you no matter what you're going through. Don't you ever forget what God has done for you in your life. Tell somebody, don't forget his faithfulness. Come on, tell them, don't forget his faithfulness. The reason why we have trouble in church with this text is because we don't help people understand that your stinginess is a heart condition towards God. And you're asking people to give money to a church without dealing with their hearts. It's like trying to get blood from a turnip and it just ain't going to happen until you remind people how good God has been to them and remind people that you wouldn't have a, a pot to use the bathroom in or a window to throw it out of and how God has kept your mind and kept your family and kept you in your right mind and your body. Then 10% of what I have don't mean so much. God, take 50% if it means you're going to keep preserving me. Take 60% if it means you're going to keep preserving me. People who don't know how to handle texts mess people up and get people confused. The truth of the matter is you got folk that are arguing that this is Old Testament and that you don't have to tithe because it's Old Testament. Let me help you. Let me help, let me help you understand. First of all, Jesus said, I did not come to do away with the law. He said, I came to do what the law could not do. He said, now I want you to give, not because you're afraid of a curse, because I came to redeem you from a curse. He said, I need you to give because you love me enough, because you're not in a transaction with me, you're in a relationship with me. And in a relationship, come, 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 because the Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. I actually want more than 10%. Y'all ain't having no church with me. I want you to give me whatever it is that your heart says that you love me as. You can start at 10, but the truth of the matter is I've been better than 10% to you. The issue we have with God, Jeremiah, is that we have fatal familiarity with God. The word familiarity it breeds contempt. Yeah. Whenever you get too familiar with somebody, you start to have contempt for them. The lack of revelation that I'm about to give you in this text, the lack of revelation breeds degradation. The word degradation means to treat or regard somebody with contempt. The word contempt means, watch it, Feeling a person or a thing is beneath you or beneath consideration or worthless. What happened to Israel is they got so familiar with God that they lost how much he was worth to them. You know, sometimes you can be such a blessing to somebody that they get used to you. And sometimes, Hawa, you have to bless them with your absence. So they remember how powerful your presence is. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. I, I don't know who that word is for, but you think I'm regular? Let me show you what you are without me. Oh, 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 okay. You forgot how powerful I am? Let me give you a season without me. I feel like preaching. Oh, and by the way, this is the last of book in the Old Testament. And after this book, God was silent for 400 years. There was no prophet that said a thing. 
there was nobody that would open their mouth and say God said because God said if you're going to hold me in contempt if you're going to make sure act as if I am worthless in your life if you're going to not remember what I have done I'm going to bless you with my absence and by the time God speaks again in Matthew they are begging for God to open his mouth and speak Oh, can you touch your neighbor? I want some power now. For the first time today and tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, be careful that you don't get too familiar with God. Come on, tell them, say, neighbor, be careful that you don't get too familiar with God. Act like he's awesome in your life. Act like you can't breathe without him. Act like you wouldn't have made it without him. Act like he's everything to you. Act like if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't have nothing in your life. Let me hear the voice of somebody that knows he is your everything. Now I want to help you. Uh, behavior is connected to belief. If I believe, you will know it by how I act. I said, if I believe, you will know it by how I act. Because my behavior is connected to my belief. Can I get just a few more minutes? Clock says I got 13. Can I get 13 minutes? It's a danger being familiar with God. They're asking God, well, how have we robbed you? He says, you've gotten so familiar with me that you're giving me your leftovers when I'm the only reason you got something left over. But the love of God, while God is feeling contempt from his people that he created, while he is feeling overlooked, by his creation, who is this helping me preach? <laughs> preach this thing, woman of God. <laughs> While he is feeling this, understand the power of this, yeah. the fact that he has stuck in there and hung in there with his people. Yeah. Because if you really study creation, you will know that there are people that existed before he created Adam. He had already scrapped one group of people and started over. Which is why it's so powerful when the Bible says Noah found grace. Because everybody wants to meet Adam. And everybody wants to see their grandparents when they get to heaven. But I want to see Noah. Because Noah is the reason that Adam's race is still alive. Noah took his family because he found grace and preserved us and we're able to be here because Noah found grace. But if he scrapped people before, why is he being so patient with me now? And he still loves them despite their fatal familiarity. And despite them forgetting his faithfulness. And he says, hear me, I love you so much that I'm going to keep giving you chances. He says, if you will turn this thing around, he says, I will give you fruit for your faithfulness. Watch it. The word faithful means you have a length of time that you have been doing a thing which means I'm willing to scrap yesterday. And I'll start from today. If you will just turn, that's what repentance is all about. If you will just turn it around today, I'm willing to, risk, to scrap whatever you did yesterday, and I'm willing to give you the fruit even though you forgot about me. I'm trying to help somebody. Watch what he says. He says, I want you to prove me. I want you to test me. I'm giving you permission to put me on the witness stand. 
and see if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough. To what he's really saying is because there was a drought in the land. The land was unbearing. So what he's really saying is that I'm going to open heaven and let it rain so you can have your fruit. And some of you are not living in Israel, but you got a drought in your life. I need to hear the voices of some people who can say it's been kind of dry in my life. <laughs> But some of that is because we forgot his faithfulness. I know, you can be quiet. You can't say amen, say ouch. Some of us, it's because we've been too familiar with God. But can I tell you that God's about to give you fruit? Somebody open your mouth and say, I believe this is going to be a fruitful season for me. It's going to... I, I could. I could shout you right there but I would be making you miss out on the revelation of this. So I can't shout you right there. In fact, we may not shout. He says, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring all the tithe to the storehouse. Now, one must ask themselves, what is the storehouse? First of all, they didn't bring chickens to the storehouse because the storehouse was a place that they brought seed. It, it's, it's, it's in your text. It's there. So they didn't bring cattle. It was a place for seed. And so what God is saying is, I, I need your seed in the storehouse. There's a reason why he said the tithe and the offering is where you have robbed me. Because the offering were the lambs that they were bringing that were crippled. But the tithe was about something totally different. The tithe was an offering of seed. And it was a tenth because it represented two things. It represented testimony. The reason you owe me the tenth is because I have given you a testimony. If I were to call you up and give you the mic and let you testify, the things that God has brought you through in your life would free many of us. And God says, because I gave you that testimony, I'm asking you, the next thing, the next thing the 10th represents is responsibility. Because I gave you that testimony, you have the responsibility now to give me the 10th back. But here's, it, here's the thing, since the storehouse is a gathering of seed or grain, it means that my money is not the most powerful seed that I'm giving. First of all, who told you your tithe wasn't a seed? Your tithe is a seed, it's just a mandatory seed. It's a seed that you can figure out based upon the income that you make. But it's not just about your money. It's about whatever it is that God has given you. It is based upon what this seed is. Now let's go back. Let's rewind because you know I believe that everything that is foundational can be found in Genesis 1, 2, or 3. In Genesis 1, verse number 29, he says, I've given you seed. I've given you an herb bearing a seed. And I've given you a fruit yielding a seed. And he said, these seeds are going to be meat for you. Lord, help me. If you read the Bible like I do, my question was, what is this meat? And how do seeds make meat? And then I come across Malachi, and he says, bring all the tithe to the storehouse, where the same seed I talked about in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29 is, bring it and that seed is going to be meat, that there may be meat in my house. Yeah. Now again, if you read the Bible like I do, you have to be questioning, what is this meat? Yeah. Yeah. And then I remember the Apostle Paul says, I want you to graduate from the milk of the Word of God to the meat of the Word of God. And then I remembered that Jesus said, 
when he was giving the parable of the sower, that the parable is this. He first says, it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He says, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. And puts a period at the end of the sentence. Which means there's nothing left to add. Be so, so before my tithe is money, my tithe is a word. And the reason why I have trouble giving money is because I have not gotten into the deeper things of the word of God. In other words, God says, uh, in my house, uh, I need my people to have revelation. And if they have revelation, then they will give their money. We are too immature in God's house, which is the reason why we got to have bake sales and ask people and beg people to give. But the truth of the matter is, there is enough blessing in God's house that if enough people stop forgetting God's faithfulness and being so familiar with God, there are enough of us who understand that he has given me a testimony. And because he's given me a testimony, I am responsible now to make sure that my money transforms into a seed. And I realize that not, by not giving him what I owe him, uh, I am removing God's hand from my life in a way that is causing him to say, you have forgotten about me. But today there's a people in here who want to press into a deeper place in God. Because we don't just want your money, we need you with a deeper revelation. Because God says what happens uh, when you come into the storehouse is uh, I need you to give based upon the word that's on the inside of you. And so, much of us, so many of us have given thousands of dollars to the church uh, and don't even know who Jesus is. Some have given millions to the church and don't even know who Jesus is. God says I need you to teach my people who I am. I need there to be meat in the lives of my people. And you're giving and still on milk. You're giving your money and still on meat. Where is the meat of God in your life? Because once you see who God is, people don't have to beg you for your money. Watch it. The disciple says, Lord, teach us how to pray. He says, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to your father in secret and he will reward you openly. Watch it. The word closet for the 50 of y'all who will give God praise over the mysteries of his word. The word closet means storehouse. Which means I don't even want you praying from a place that there is no seed. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Some of us are trying to pray, but we can't pray effectively because nobody ever taught us that the storehouse is not the church. The storehouse is a place in your life where the word of God resides. That you've got so much seed built up in you that every time it's time to give, I'm not wrestling with God or the devil about my money. How much is it you want me to give, Lord? Because you've been so good to me. You bless my family in such a way. You've healed my body in such a way. You've delivered me in such a Can I hear the voice of people in here that can feel meat forming in your life? Now remember the room before and look at the room now. I know it's a lot to chew on, but I want everybody standing in this room. God says, I have proven everything I need to prove to you. I've given you everything that you need for the next season of your life. And God said, what I want from you now is for you to take me off the witness stand and know that I am the God of your meat. That there's going to be another level of revelation that's going to break out in your life that this time as you give, that you're giving from a place that no doubt resides. Do you remember how good I've been to you? Can you remember how much I've done for you? 
that before I come after your money, I'm always coming after your seed of your heart. I want to know that you have been pressed into a deeper place in my word. And sometimes we're asking money from people or asking from seed, for seed from people without putting any seed in people. I need you to understand that because of where God is taking you, that God desires another level of seed from you. Before we even give you a chance to come, I want you to make up in your mind whether you're coming or not. If you believe you're supposed to be connected to this house, that's a decision you're going to make right now, but we're going to give before we do that. Because I'm tired of just going through the rigmarole of church. People don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. Where have we robbed you, God? Because you've given me these lame offerings. Stuff you wouldn't give nobody else. And you've neglected to understand that in you there is a storehouse that can never understand giving if it's not full of seed, if it's not full of my word, if my word is not in your heart. David said, I will hide the seed of your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's, it's, it's because your heart is soil and the word of God is seed. I want you to legitimately right now, your tithe is easy. It's 10% of whatever it is, but I want you to ask God of over and above that what he would have you to sow today. Because we are not serving a transactional God. We're serving a relational God. He's not interested in making transactional exchanges with you. He's not asking you to buy him. He wants you to give because money is a language he's put in the earth. Hear me. God never said money was evil. He said the love of money is the root of all evil. What, what do you do with something that you love? You, you hold on to it. You, you try to spend as much time with it as possible. You really don't want to share it with anybody. You want to feel that love all the time. God said it's dangerous to fall in love with money. But then he says, occupy until I come. It means to do business. So God says, I'm not against money. I, I want you to have money. It's currency. It means it's supposed to move. Some of us are keeping our money from moving because of what we won't sow. And every time you give a tithe, understand that it is seed. You're putting something in the ground. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed, and I want you to seek God today. You can start at the 10%, but I need you to ask God, God, beyond that, what would you have me to give? Father, speak to the hearts of your people now. Speak to the hearts of your people now. I want you to have real conversations with them because this seed is about to change the trajectory of their lives. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want everybody, as you figure out what you're about to sow, I want you that believe that what you're about to sow is going to change your trajectory. I need you to open your mouth and before you sow it, you're going to attach a praise to what you're about to sow. God is not convinced. Some of you got some coming up to do, come on. As you're talking to God, if you believe that what you're about to sow is going to change the trajectory of the path you are on. That as we sow today, we are not just sowing in money, but the word of God has been sown in us. That in our storehouse, there was a filling of seed. I want you to attach a praise to it right now. I want you to open your mouth. Come on. Bring the music down just a little bit. I need to hear the voices. Come on. 
I need you to attach a praise to it. We won't hide behind the music. Father, I trust you. Father, you've been faithful. Father, I'm not too familiar with you. All of my life, you've been faithful. All of my life, you've been good to me. And I give your name the praise. Come on. Just 10 more seconds of praise for what you're about to sow. We'll go in the store and spend $500 on a shirt and throw God anything. We'll go in the store and spend $1,000 on a pair of shoes because the bottom of them are red but won't give God what he's due. As we get ready to sow, I want you to touch your neighbor and tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I believe that what you are about to sow is going to be the most life-changing seed you've ever sown. Now praise God for your neighbor. The ways to give are on the screen. I want everybody in this room, if you're giving, I want to do something different. I want to do something different. I want you to come And I want you to start from the rear, so my host, just help me with this. And I want you to face those outer walls. The outside walls will get you y'all last. I wanna do this middle first. I want you to face outside walls and starting from the rear, I want you to come around because I wanna touch everybody's hand. As you give it, if you're giving, even if you're giving online, just let me touch your hand. Lead servants, come in, come in. They're gonna drop it in the bucket. Oh, we got somebody here, good. They're gonna drop it in the bucket, but you're gonna touch my hand before you do it. All right, start coming now, start coming now. I wanna touch everybody. I wanna touch everybody. I wanna touch everybody. With the middle, starting with the middle. I know it's different, I know it's different. 